Okay, we're live now. Just a moment for the settings. Okay, we are live. Fantastic. Uh, so yes, as I as I mentioned, uh, as I mentioned in introducing Mel's talk, uh, this is the sort of uh, formal block of the conference, which I really like. I, I'm very excited that we could that we could have this have, have this, this this set of approaches uh, from uh, machine learning and mathematical practice uh, both in the in the meeting. So it's my real pleasure to to introduce uh, a talk that I have been really excited to see since the moment I read the abstract for the first time, actually, uh, from, uh, from Henrik, uh, Henrik Kroksorzen on digital humanities for philosophy of mathematical practice. So with that, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Charles. Thank you, everybody, for sticking around what is late in Europe. So good afternoon to, to Europe and uh, good day to, to, the, to the Americas. Uh, it's also a great pleasure for me to to be speaking at this conference. It's, it's, uh, yeah. Charles introduced it as the formal section. It's also, to me, a a, a unique opportunity or a new opportunity to speak to, to you as as an audience uh, steeped in, in uh, in in uh, digital science and in, in digital studies of digital science, something that uh, that we are not uh, really accustomed to from where I come. So let me tell, tell you a bit about from where I come. So this philosophy of mathematical practice is a relatively newcomer to the philosophy of science, even to the philosophy of mathematics. We think of ourselves as uh, empirically informed philosophers of mathematics. We don't study classical ontological and epistemological questions about mathematics so much as we study how mathematicians uh, function in those uh, philosophical frameworks. So we are uh, interested in the practice of, of mathematicians. And of course, many of you are also, uh, and I know you from many of you from the, from the philosophy of science and practice, and you can think of this as a slightly derived version of that, but aimed to mathematics with some uh, drastic differences. Uh, with come mainly from, from, from the methodologies that we'll have to, to adopt. So I want to say a few things about what is this empirically informed philosophy of mathematics that I'm talking about, and then uh, try to address how uh, digital humanities can aid us in what we want to do. And in a sense, you can see the tension of my talk in this little diagram over here. This, is, uh, uh, this depicts the number of uh, reviewed uh, let, let's, let's make it simple. This depicts the number of uh, article, articles published per year within the field of mathematics. It comes from a database called the Mathematical Reviews, which is an, a service that was introduced in the, in the late 1930s to get uh, mathematicians an overview of the development within their field. So, so the Mathematical Reviews will abstract or review uh, each of these papers, make an, an online uh, record of it and uh, and you can use that to sort of navigate the the field so that explains the drop it's not that mathematicians have stopped working uh, two years ago it's simply that there's a delay a lag in the reviewing of of their papers so you can see steep annual increase and you can see therefore aggregated increase in in the mathematical literature so any kinds of of uh, philosophical empirically informed philosophical questions we may ask about current day or contemporary mathematics will somehow have to take account of the fact that there are, as of yesterday, uh, about uh, 3,800,000 papers registered within the mathematical field. And of course, the standard methodological issues that we have long, uh, or long that we have used in, in, in asking uh, philosophical questions such as case studies or or, or specific uh, important uh, papers, those simply uh, dwarf against uh, such a, a huge practice. So we need something else to get at this. And there my, my claim and my, uh, my hope is that, that we can learn from you guys, from the digital humanities, 
uh, and digital studies of science to uh, to get at, at better tools. My slide, and it's not a promise, but it's at least a, a, a an idea to get you interested, is that there might also be a feedback mechanism. It might be that studying formal sciences like mathematics with the natural language processing with other machine learning tools uh, might offer something to the machine learning community, for instance, or simply based on the fact that mathematics is such a syntactically and semantically uh, restricted language where some of the, the, the text, the formulas, the figures uh, play into a, a more, uh, perhaps a, a more strictly confined uh, space that we can actually get uh, more fine grained natural language processing. Uh, tools to to work at that. At least that's the that's the pitch I try to sell to my uh, my computer science colleagues. I have a background myself in mathematics and computer science, and have been uh, a professor for history and philosophy of the mathematical and computational sciences here at, at Copenhagen. So I this is an, a project that sort of spans all my my interests. Here's the graph again. You can see the, the increase that was just if you couldn't see it before, but since I can't hear whether you can see it or not, I'll just skip and think that you could. So what is this empirically informed philosophy of mathematics? So usually I say that ideally, if you want to study the th kinds of things that we are interested in, in philosophy of mathematical practice, some of them are beyond our reach. We might want to figure out how mathematicians think and develop knowledge but that is at least often a private process that would require us to peel their brains open and, uh, and look at, at, at the electrode. We are not allowed to do that for legal and ethical reasons and also because it's, it's, it's not what we do, but we could at least, and that's one of the new directions, we could subject them to fMRI scans while they solve mathematical problems to see whether they use specific spatial areas of the brain. So sort of, of importing uh, methodologies from cognitive science or from other other disciplines. Um, I also would like to this picture because it it shows the sort of uh, old image of mathematics as a private and uh, individual enterprise, as as the mathematician as an autonomous agent creating new knowledge. And of course, in the history of mathematics, as in the history of science more generally, we have had a social uh, turn in the sense that we have become increasingly aware that there are social components to knowledge production uh, and recently also this practical turn. So what we're now interested in, in this emerging field of philosophy of mathematical practice is an empirical grounding to ask questions about the, the, the broad process of practice of, of doing mathematics from the heuristics and the external representations using computers, using diagrams, using uh, communication means, uh, both for, for heuristic, but also for, for proof generation. How do mathematicians communicate in formal settings through their papers, but also in, in less formal settings at the, at the blackboard? And these are uh, issues where we sometimes have empirical access in the sense that we cannot, well, we could, uh, monitor a mathematician 24-7 uh, and see what outer signs are produced from, from the creative process. But it, we lack the, the, we often lack the, the group meetings that, that, you can, uh, that you can attend in the empirical sciences to get sort of an anthropological or sociological uh, view of that. So in a sense, what we are, if, if I were to characterize it, what we are interested in are the properties of proof that go beyond simple derivation. So, so we are interested in, a, it's a, that is a statement argued against something. Typically, people have considered the philosophy of mathematics to be about how proofs generate a certain knowledge. And, and we're interested in, in broader aspects of proof, proofs as vehicles of communication, proofs as vehicle of insight, proofs of explanatory proofs, all these sort of extra things that proofs can have. Uh, and we, we want to study that. And to get at, get at that, I think we need to get out of the armchair and do uh, observations, interviews. We have done those. Uh, I have even done embeddings and collaborations, working with mathematicians, uh, in producing new knowledge and, and then reflecting on, on how that could, what that entailed in terms of division of labor, in terms of, of uh, 
interdisciplinarity in this or trust uh, social epistemology in the sense that 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 you have to trust each other both for the epistemic claims but also of course for the for all the other uh, say moral uh, elements of, of a, a group collaboration we, we you could do focus groups or delphi studies you could many have done historical case studies but the closest we get uh, from say an n equals to one study or at least small n studies to bigger n studies have been have been questionnaires and uh, and even those are uh, at a relatively small size and a relatively small small sample but luckily uh, recently there has also been a much more interest in driving the methodological discussions about uh, this new field of, of philosophy of mathematical practice and i want to to flash the uh, and Rabadine and, and Matthew English book uh, or anthology that is sort of uh, setting new uh, new uh, ideas into how we can approach this methodologically. And you can see what I want to say uh, as a, a specific addition to 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 that uh, developing new models or new new methods for 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 doing uh, getting at the philosophy, getting at the practice that we want to study in PMP. Okay, so that's that's the pitch. That's what I want you to sort of hook on to. Uh, there are these guys doing philosophy of mathematical practice. Their practice is uh, out of their reach, either because it's eth unethical or because it's 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 what Matthew English often uh, scornfully calls exemplar philosophy. So if we want to get at a grounded, uh, empirically informed philosophy that does not uh, only relate to a few exemplars, then we need to uh, develop new tools. And digital humanities, in its broadest sense, could, could be such tools. And when I say digital humanities, it's because I don't want to be very specific about exactly what it could be. It could be big data, just analyzing, statistically analyzing big data. It could be more refined natural language processing. It could be image detection and image classification. And we have we have tried all of, of these, or we are trying and developing all of these approaches in, in our program. So let me say a few words about uh, the, the thing at stake here. So <laughs> um, I see myself as asking and answering philosophical questions. And when I say digital humanities, at least in the old days, in the, in the literature uh, branch of digital humanities, it was often a matter of simply stating facts and uh, counting how many, uh, when, when the word boat and, and, uh, and ship is used in Moby Dick and, and counting those or counting which characters enter which sections of a drama. That's, the, that's, the, that's getting the empirical material, but I want it to be also sellable, sellable to my philosophical colleagues. So I want to, or the, the design that we, are, that we are envisioning is to start from an established philosophical question or concept that we then want to explore using uh, all kinds of statistical tools. And then we can go one of two ways. We can either uh, use the statistical exploration to pick out uh, exemplars <laughs> uh, for, for qualitative analysis that can be, uh, these exemplars will then hopefully be more representative or at least have certain qualities that are beyond just picking a random example or a frequent example, and then uh, based on that qualitative analysis, uh, refer it back to the philosophical discussions. Or we could do I have a more sort of <laughs> scientific method approach uh, with a hypothesis test if we can somehow instrumentalize the, uh, the, the phenomenon that we are interested in. And we are, we are trying to do that, but that is certainly further away from, from the, the, the philosophical way of, of thinking about it that we are, that we are that we're coming from, but in the end, it's a it's a it's a tool. What I want from digital humanities is a partial tool to turn philosophical questions into philosophical analysis through this statistical exploration uh, that I that I have here. And that sounds all very uh, uh, broad and and perhaps even uh, empty. But let me give you just uh, just a few examples. So one thing that that this new approach, if it's a new approach, but new approach in our field has turned up is we have new corpora. We have new sources of empirical information that we didn't know how to access previously. 
Uh, and many of these corpora are, of course, as you, as you know, they are preferably born digital. Uh, so my colleagues, I think last year, studied online uh, mathematical discussions, searching for explanatory phrases in an online uh, problem solving, uh, uh, say bulletin board or, or uh, social media. That was born digital, they could get the data relatively quickly, but they lack or they had a hard time analyzing it because they were they were looking uh, by human eyes for for these explanatory structures. So what what this allows us to do is to look for other corpora that are born digital, and of course the the mathematical review that I started uh, showing you is a surprisingly underused uh, corpus of uh, of mathematical uh, insight. I think it's underused because it is what I call secondary. It's not the mathematical knowledge produced itself because those are in the journal papers, but it's reviews of those uh, journal papers. So it's opinions, summaries, and uh, connections drawn between uh, or in the, in the literature, but drawn by uh, colleagues and others who are experts within the field. So we can mine that for all kinds of, of secondary information which will somehow uh, ask uh, or allow us to, to get at, at, the, uh, at the philosophical questions that, that we have. So that could be one, uh, one new corpus that is underanalyzed. Another corpus that we are working with is of course the archive, but that I wouldn't say is underanalyzed, but the mathematics part of it is perhaps still underanalyzed and something that we can do and use as a test bed for, for our analysis and our hypothesis. And I want to give you two of the examples that we have done. It's a relatively new project, but we are, we are working with uh, students and colleagues and the collaborators overseas to, to, to get at this. It's a small community and it's a sort of pushing our, pushing our stamp on, on this. This is from uh, work that one of our students has, I hope, just turned in today for her master's thesis, where we exactly use this uh, mathematical reviews or uh, math sign it data, we do a query, and then she ends up with a corpus. She was interested in studying experiments in mathematics. And, and uh, for those of you not in the know about that, experiments are typically not a classical justificatory practice in, in mathematics. But nevertheless, since the 1990s, mathematicians have begun speaking about explanatory or uh, experimental mathematics as a, as a specific a subgenre of, of mathematical discovery. So she was interested in, in studying experiments in mathematics and we ran the analysis and she ended up with a corpus and she wanted to, to do a categorization of the kinds of uses that this word experiment was taken to mean in the reviews of mathematical literature. But she still ended up with, I think, uh, after, after the initial filtering, she ended up with about 50,000 records that mention experiment, which is itself is a bit uh, perhaps surprising, given that it, experiments were not supposed to play a major role in mathematics. But, but for the, the qualitative analysis, we used, uh, we then trained and used a, a, a binary classifier to sample or to filter out the part of the sample that was concerned with uh, numerical verification of, uh, of mathematical claims. So there's a specific large chunk, about 30% of the uses of, of the word experiment in mathematics that is about numerical verification of claims. And, and once that is established, then she didn't want to see more of those for her qualitative analysis. And of course, this is now absolutely not quantitative, but, but we have shifted focus here. And she wanted to see uh, more examples of the other uh, other type, types of, of use of experiments in these reviews. So we could use a, a, a machine to filter out um, the part that was already relatively well understood and it actually could be trained on, on the, I would say surprisingly, it could be trained on the sparse data that, that we had to, to, sufficient, uh, to be sufficiently effective to be of use for her in, in getting at the, the sample that she wanted. So this is one pathway of the graph that I showed you before from the philosophical question about experiments in mathematics then to statistical exploration and filtering into this qualitative analysis that then ends up in what will be her argument. I have still to read the thesis, but I imagine that there will be from 
not just imagine, I have talked to her, of course, but there will be a new classification of, of various types of uses of experiments in these uh, reviews that we can then uh, take back to the philosophical literature and, and study as part of, of, of that. So that's one of the ways that we have tried to use uh, machine learning agents in, in, uh, in focusing our attention in this huge corpus that, that, we are, that we are now approaching because it has become feasible to us. The other part, which is perhaps more to, to, to this, I, would, I don't know, it, it could be closer to what, what you, what you, what what is done in the in this in the in the sciences in the digital studies of the sciences, is uh, <laughs> I work with my colleague Mikkel Willem Johansen, who last I think three years ago he started. He's interested in diagrams. Diagrams play a specific role in the philosophy of mathematics and the philosophy of mathematical practice because they are external representations of thought, and they play the specific role. Uh, and philosophical discussion going back to, to Peirce and, and, and so on, that they can somehow be uh, part of an argument. They can, you can do diagrammatic reasoning. So we, therefore they are uh, often studied, but the kinds of, of diagrams that are studied are often of, of, of relatively small uh, sample type. So they'll either be commutative diagrams such as those that you see here, or they could be uh, simple knot diagrams from from uh, from topology. Those are the prevalent and Euclidean diagrams, construction diagrams from Euclid. Those are the three I would say prevalent uh, types discussed. But there are many many more diagrams out there. So what? Uh, so poor Miguel, uh, he made a sample of uh, three journals every five years. And he looked through all of them, noted when there was a diagram occurring on a page. So he had to, he had to flip 53,000 pages by hand. And once he had done that, I, I made the stupid remark that I think I could do that. I think I could help him uh, by automating that process. So, so we, we put this uh, image detection uh, routine uh, together. It's trained against a, a, a relatively small corpus and then put to use or, uh, to predict on, on Mikkel's uh, hand-drawn uh, hand corpus and then uh, put out in, in the wild. Um, and it's a, it functions surprisingly well. It needs to be tested again or developed further because it's trained on just one journal and applied to these three journals. But, but we are very confident and you can see it, it scores rather nicely with at least these diagrams. Of course, I didn't pick the ones where it scores uh, wrong. It's actually fun. It scores some images as diagrams that I wouldn't classify as diagrams and we wouldn't classify as diagrams because we have made a decision and a definition of when in the coding process, when something is coded as a diagram. But many of these are actually uh, issues that are discussed in the literature, for instance, what is known as a, as a chain fraction. That's a two-dimensional object or it could be written on, a, on one line. So this two-dimensionality, uh, it, it apparently uh, fulfills, but which is a part of the standard definition of what is a mathematical diagram. So that is picked up by the machine learner and we have to sort of say, no, 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 that's, that's not what we meant. And then we have to develop uh, the machine learner for that. We also decided to rule out matrices because they don't have this uh, reasoning potential as much as diagrams, what we typically think of as diagrams do, but we did include uh, commutative diagrams, although in mathematical practice, they are actually very often uh, almost simple like. So, so, so the, the entire conceptual uh, analysis of what is a diagram or not, we actually uh, had some very nice discussions uh, between what humans, what previous philosophers, and what uh, the computer would, would think of as a, as a diagram. So we trained that and got the, the sort of proof of concept that we, could, that we could do that. But then becomes a question of what can we use it for? What kinds of philosophical issues could we use it for? And one of the things that we uh, definitely want to correlate is uh, discipline specific issues, for instance, in in the use of figures or the use of diagrams. That's something we're working on. And there's this very nice uh, 
I was reminded of this in the in the keynote talk uh, earlier today. There's this nice paperscape uh, visualization of the archive. So so we we are putting the the uh, the diagram detector to to work on mathematical papers in the archive, trying to figure out whether there are uh, more or less visual uh, components of or disciplines in in mathematics, and trying to to figure out how to characterize that in a in a quantitative way, working with uh, people who also know a lot more about about uh, visualization and and statistics than I do. So so that's at least uh, there are two there are two. Uh, I gave away two pieces of, of, of information uh, besides the content there. One is, yeah, of course, when you have a tool, you look for what you can use it for. Isn't that what, what tools are great for? And the other is that it takes an interdisciplinary team to, to do these kinds of, of interdisciplinary work that, that digital humanities and mathematical practice will pose. And, and in our team, we are uh, both mathematicians, uh, cognitive scientists, and, and a few statisticians and philosophers. So it, it takes that kind of, of setup, but it's then very rewarding when, when we actually get to talk about these things. So one thing is uh, how do visual elements of mathematical practice uh, spread uh, or how are they used in different parts of, of the field? And we'll need to, or the discipline, different sub, sub disciplines within mathematics, and we'll need to, to also work at visualization of, of how that is going on. But I said, I said that we could also uh, hope to, to give something back to the machine learning community. And part of it is what I'm trying to sell there is this sort of four, four uh, step program, what we call the Chung and Cheek, of course, we call the Copenhagen program for machine learning and philosophical studies of mathematical diagrams. One, we see that there is a lot of philosophical study drawn from a small set of different diagrams. We want to enlarge in that set to, bet, to get at a, a better and more empirically informed uh, philosophical analysis. So the first task is to train and develop better uh, detectors. We are, we are working at that. Second task is then to challenge the classifications that humans, philosophers, mathematicians would come up with of these diagrams and perhaps challenge them in a way that could be used exploratorily by our colleagues. Uh, say, if you, if, you, uh, if you specify the clustering algorithm and you specify a few uh, keynotes uh, in the clusters, how would it group a corpus of diagrams that you would have and what could you see? So the, so the inexplicable nature of the, of the machine learning uh, could perhaps even stimulate uh, us to, uh, to, to revisit some of the classifications that we would have. That sounds, that perhaps sounds, sounds uh, very far off, but given that there are so many different types of diagrams in use in mathematical practice today, Miguel is glad that he stopped his, his study five years ago, because if he were to, to cover the last five years, it would just have exploded into, into different uh, different types of diagrams. But given that we can do the, we, we have the diagrams, we have the closest context that they are presented in, and we can therefore perhaps uh, develop proxies that would, that would actually allow for some kind of, of, uh, of meaningful unsupervised classification of these diagrams. To the historical side, we want to Everybody's talking about epidemiology these days. We also want to do our epidemiology, but of mathematical diagrams. So how do these things spread in the mathematical literature? It's fairly easy to, to link them to, to metadata. And then again, we are back in the more sort of traditional digital humanities uh, approach that, that would study the spread or the, the correlation between content and, and metadata. So, so those would be sort of new issues where we would need to speak to, and will are speaking to computer scientists uh, to, to get their interest in it as well, but which would immediately inform uh, the empirically informed philosophy of mathematical practice better. And as a byproduct, it can even help us do a more sensitive selection of, of interesting diagrams for contextual analysis, a bit like the thing that I showed you with my student where we had filtered out all the similar things uh, so as to focus attention on the, on the more specific ones. So it's a bit of a pitch. It's, it's a bit of a, this is what we have done. This is what we would like to do, but I hope at least to have 
indicated, shown to you that we can put digital humanities, machine learning, natural language processing, image detection to use in philosophy of mathematical practice. So it can serve as an aid to us. That might, that's good for us. That might be, be less interesting for, for the other side. We also, I'm particularly interested in how this drives methodological reflections, both on the philosophy of mathematical practice side, but also in the terms of, of the digital humanities or machine learning side, that there are, uh, is there a way in which we could actually use the, the, uh, the, the lack of explanat explanatory power of a machine learner, not, not to see that as a problem, but to see that as a, as a question for, for uh, independent ways of, of analyzing the, the phenomenon. And, and therefore also that there's a, there might even be a pushback to, to the machine learning. Uh, when I talk to, to our expert uh, computer scientists, they're very interested in this uh, limited or restricted uh, semantic, also syntactic, but mainly semantic setup that is, that is posed by mathematical texts as a combination of text formulas and, and figures because each of those they can analyze, but they can get at a better uh, comprehension of, of the content or we would like to get from the philosophical side at a better comprehension of the context by combining uh, these three elements and, and possibly more. So that was, uh, that was the, uh, the end of what I wanted to say. So I hope you have questions. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Yes. Uh, so I have a, I have a, a, a semi uh, clarificatory expansion uh, question uh, uh, while we wait on a few more to come in, although there's already, there's already some others. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll take the uh, chair's prerogative one more time tonight. Um, what kind of features do you expect the classifier to be picking up on in the diagrams? Do you think it's mostly going to be kind of spatial shape structure type stuff? Do you think it's going to be able to see some sort of content, contentful uh, uh, kind of analysis? I, I'm just interested, you know, a, a mixture of both or, or are you, or you really, really have no idea and you're actually hoping, I got a bit, a bit of the idea that you're hoping to be surprised by what you find when you apply it, which I, I know that feeling, right? I get that. Uh, but yeah, what are you, what are you thinking it will, it will, it will see? Certainly willing to be surprised by what it, by what it finds. Um, I, so, so the classification that we did or that Miguel did for, for his paper, that was, that was based in different types of cognitive offloads. So, so resemblance or uh, algebraic or what he called abstract. And at least the abstract class, which is free of resemblance to geometrical situations or or spatial issues. That is a huge class that is that is difficult to uh, to to put under one unless you get at everything that looks as a, at a as a, a as a commutative diagram. So I'm hoping that that it could uh, find some of the standard types of that, at least that's what I'm feeding into it. So that it it should be able to detect uh, known types of 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 existing diagrams. Um, it should ideally, at least when, when we get the, the, uh, the part text, the intertextuality aspect going, it should ideally also be able to, to combine the diagrams with the surrounding, surrounding argument, uh, figure out what kind of, of role does the diagram play. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a joke, which is actually a true joke in mathematics, that is an entire proof is see the diagram or chase the diagram and then end of proof. Uh, so these diagrams do play an, a, an epistemic role in, in, the, in the communication, but also perhaps in the thinking. And it would be nice if it could pick out, pick out those. And then uh, also more, perhaps more subtle differences that, that, we, could, that we could see. Um, one of the projects we're also involved in is, is tracing diagrams in physics in a specific, specific uh, uh, branch of Feynman diagrams that we, we want to trace. And that will actually, that it will be much more restricted what it's looking at, but we want to, to quantify uh, the prevalence of a, of a specific uh, form of, of, of Feynman diagrams. 
so it, it, it's not necessarily that I want a different classification or come up with it. What, I, what we meant by this uh, part two is actually ideally to make available to our colleagues who try out different classifications, a corpus and a clustering mechanism that would allow them to, to sort of see what, try to describe philosophically what would be their, their classification and then see it run on, on, a, on a corpus of, of examples because at least some of us in the philosophy of mathematical practice are, are are committed to the to the uh, to the examples, even if they show that that our classifications are are a bit off. Very cool. Did that answer your question? Yeah, no, I think yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thanks so much. Um, let me go to a next question here from uh, from Stefan Hesbergen, who asks: uh, Is it a viable strategy to in the in the mathematics community to parse LaTeX source for for papers or preprints and try to come at come at diagrams or, or or reasoning from from that side? Is there is there data like that available? There is data like that available per se, and that's what we're doing. Um, so so the so so um, <clears throat> that's at least part of what we're doing for the triangulation. So the the image detector runs on images. Of course, and picks out diagrams in in images, uh, partly because it's it. I mean, Miguel Miguel tried Miguel trained it for a, a century of mathematical publication. So I'm also a historian, so I, I want to it to be able to do that. Uh, but but what we are doing now is we are trying to correlate uh, the image detection with the with the structural information that we can get from from LaTeX, and we and we 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 can do quite a lot, and and we can. We can get uh, structural information. We can get what I call contexts. So there, there, there might be an, an outer context of, an, of a paper and, and there might be a theorem statement, which is an inner context. And there might be a proof of a theorem, which is also an inner context and so on. So we can, we can try to figure out where uh, structurally uh, different types of, of text or different types of, of figures uh, occur and then link that to, to the, uh, to the uh, to the images that we get, and of course, it's also a great training uh, set for for uh, for the uh, for the uh, for the image detector, because we would then know exactly where where we could trace exactly where the uh, where the images occur. So yes, and there's also the SIGMATH link uh, uh, special interest group on mathematical linguistics who uh, uh, who sort of curate. A LaTeX data set of, of the archive, but the entire archive is available through Kaggle and uh, and uh, and DS Util. So you can actually, yeah, we are we are we are, we we have quite a lot of data. Um, nice, nice position to be in. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, one more. Oh, several more questions. Cool. This is great. Uh, uh, so the next uh, next question coming in from uh, from Alexander Samanek, who asks, uh, Do you think that that these questions in philosophy of mathematical practice could offer us any insight into machine learning when it comes to, uh, in particular, to things like explanation or algorithm interpretability, because that's been a, a bit of a theme through, through some of your remarks. I hope so, uh, because I also, I mean, what I try to present today is, is if we have this tool called machine learning or, or digital humanities more broadly, I can apply it, but I also want to give something back. And the, especially the, the discussion about explainability in, in AI is something that is that I'm very interested in. And I think many of those, it, it might not be this particular approach, but many of those discussions would, would, would benefit tremendously if some of, of the philosophers of science and, and philosophically uh, inclined uh, computer scientists uh, would get a, I mean, a bigger voice in in that discussion, and I think the my my suggestion that it could be that that my classifier would come up with something that is uh, that is surprising to me and therefore requiring explanation, but I can't get I can't ask the classifier to give me that explanation because it's black it's opaque, but it will still prompt me to 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 think about and provide human uh, explanations for humans. Uh, so I think that that is that is at least a, a motivating force. I think the biggest uh, philosophical uh, computational uptake of, of what we do is we're also interested in um, 
we have a, a similar paper on on what is uh, so there are things called interactive theorem provers so computer programs that help mathematicians prove theorems and those are sort of a, a subgenre of, of mathematics today they are studied by formal mathematicians or people interested in logic and a few who are sort of mainstream mathematicians use them for for their teaching uh, relatively few and we have then combined the philosophical of math philosophy of mathematical practice studies of what is what are the drivers of of human mathematicians well they want it to be recognizable they want it to be at the right if they choose a problem at the right level of difficulty they want it to be uh, within their in, within their toolbox uh, and those criteria how do we they want to use external representations like diagrams they want to publish uh, something that can be read by other mathematicians and many of these uh, are exactly the I wouldn't say stumbling blocks, but the great obstacles that that interactive and automated theorem provers are are coming up against these days. They want they are extremely good at they are shown extreme progress in finding proofs, but getting getting the rest of the mathematical community to give up their sort of human proofs uh, is is difficult, uh, and it's it's even not completely acceptable to publish something by by computer proof, right? So so so. We can perhaps point to, from the philosophy of mathematical practice, we can point to items or perspectives on human mathematical practice that would, uh, that would ease, say, the, the use of, of ITPs into, into ordinary mainstream mathematical practice if it could fulfill more of these uh, concerns that, that human mathematicians have. So that's, that's, that's a different way of, of being of service to, to, the, to the mathematics community, but, but it is closer to us, I think. That's very cool. That's very cool. Thanks. Um, question from, uh, from Moti Mizrahi, who asks, uh, do you think that a similar approach uh, can be applied to study symbolism or notation in mathematical practice in addition to diagrams? Sure. <laughs> I, think it, I think we can do most things that we are that we are that we're interested in. That's also what my computer science uh, collaborators say. Yeah, mathematics is so nice. It's a it's a limited, it's a finite alphabet. You can just yeah, we can do. But but the thing is, uh, what would be I mean, yeah, notation. What would be what would be interesting philosophical questions about notation that we that we could could ask? Of course, we could use the same. Uh, we could more or less take the the four steps here and say, please, uh, please uh, figure out how to to count various notations, various concepts even. Uh, please uh, classify them. Please see how they spread across disciplines. Yes, of course we could we could try to, to do that. They're not they're not visual in the same sense that that the diagrams are. So we would have to uh, if we cannot get at the at the structural source text, there would have to be a different detection mechanism. But yes, we could. But, but I think the, the interesting uh, thing is that, that both for the experiments in mathematics and for the diagrams in mathematics, there are, there are standing discussions that we can sort of, of uh, tap into and, and contribute to. And there's also a huge standing discussion on, on notation, but I'm not so sure whether, whether that would I mean, I don't know. Let's see. I, I would love to talk about that. You, get, you, you have my Twitter handle. Send me a, send me a, a message. We, yes, we could. Um, I'm sorry that that doesn't really, oh, no, no, really that's answer a, the question. But but it, 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 I'm I'm quite optimistic that we can do things. I'm I'm less optimistic that that my philosophy colleagues will recognize it as as contributing to their discipline. Uh, well, which may or may not be a concern perennial. for me perennial issue. Um, yeah. Question, a bit more historical question from, from Luca Rivelli, who asks, uh, do you have any hypothesis on the possible changing role of diagrams in mathematics? So do you expect them to have to have changed roles, say, from being proofs in a Euclidean context to, to having a more explanatory role today? Definitely. And that's also why uh, Miguel chose to, so Miguel chose to study uh, diagrams in the last century. Uh, well, that's not no longer the last century, but but from the end of the 19th century to 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 the beginning of the of the 21st century, and what he noticed was a, a a shift. So he noticed two shifts. He noticed a shift in the 
prevalence of diagrams and he noticed a shift in his typology, which focused on these, uh, these different uh, cognitive offloads. Uh, so of course, Euclidean diagrams were very prevalent before, uh, of course I say, but I'll, I'll tell you, Euclidean diagrams were very prevalent before the war, Second World War, then came a period with few diagrams and then a period with very abstract uh, diagrams uh, in, as, as algebraic topology gained, gained uh, importance in mathematics. Right? And then came the explosion in the, in the late, late uh, 20th century, early, first, early 21st century with, with a diverse zoo of, of diagrams. So yes, of course, it's, it's, uh, it, it, there is a historical development in that. Um, Miguel has done the, the hand calculations or the hand counting for three journals in five year intervals. The next easy thing I will do is put, put the detector to, to test on a, on a bigger corpus, then we will know more about uh, shifts and, and changes. Do I have a hypothesis? Yes, Miguel also, I think, offers that. There's, of course, also a gen, a, 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 he starts in the late 19th century because there's a, there's a philosophical opposition to the use of diagrams, right? Hilbert and Pasch and these people saying, you cannot draw uh, inference from, from diagrams. You have to formalize it in some way. And he expected that that would mean that there would be few diagrams in the early period. That's of course not the case because there's also a, a geometry site that uses a lot of, of Euclidean diagrams. Then came this sort of valley uh, that, that, that was when uh, Bourbakist uh, formalist mathematics really set in and then came sort of the opposite again. So, so in a sense for the historian in me, it's, it's not so surprising uh, that he sees that, but it's interesting what he sees in those, in those figures, that he sees a, a shift in the types of diagrams, that he sees new diagrams emerging, old diagrams sort of getting borderline, and that he sees this huge explosion where it might be, that might be a hypothesis, that diagrams today are more vehicles of uh, explaining something or getting the user to understand what you mean, rather than this uh, this epistemic uh, uh, tool for 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 argument. That would be at least one hypothesis that you could that I would try to to uh, to investigate with the with the last twenty five years of of diagram. Fantastic. Well, on that note, uh, my apologies, Moti, I have to abandon your last question, but we are we are out of time for the evening. Um, thanks very much, Henrik. Thanks very much, everyone. That is, of course, the end of day one of the conference. I will hopefully see many, if not all of you back here tomorrow, same, same time, same website, same everything, etc. cetera, uh, 14, uh, 2 p.m. Central European, 9 a.m. East Coast, uh, USA. So thanks, everyone, very much. It's been a fantastic first day and uh, looking forward to looking forward to more uh, for the next for the next three days coming. 